Hello, I'm Tim Stockdale, and welcome to the second video in the three-part series, Successful Show Jumping. If you remember from video one, we discussed the basic riding position. Starting from the bottom, try to remember that the stirrup leather must be vertical. By having a vertical stirrup leather, we know that the weight is going downwards, i.e. into the heel. Therefore, we get a, a good lower leg position. Coming up, keeping the seat light. The seat bones should be in a soft position in contact with the saddle. We should have a little hollow in the base of our back. Nice open shoulders. Vitally important is to remember the L shape in our arm position and the arm traveling along the direction to the horse's mouth and bit. We keep the shoulder joints nice and open. So again, to allow us to have an elasticity with our horse's contact. We don't want to be stiff. We don't want our arms going straight. We want to have that nice little, like I said, kink here. And this allows us to give, take as the horse requires. The head position should be nicely up, looking forwards, being able to feel what's happening underneath you. It looks a little bit stiff, but the more you practice it, the more you remember the certain little points, the more you'll adopt a better position to give you more balance and to allow you to put the weight through the lower leg off the seat and therefore the horse's back to be so much lighter when it's doing its work. And the hand position again, not in a stiff and tight way, but in a nice positive but soft way to allow the contact to be nice and relaxed with our horse. Good girl. We're now going to do a little bit about the way the horse goes. And what I really stress to my riders is the horse should go in a relaxed but balanced fashion going forward all the time, working from behind. As a rider, it's vitally important that you do not force the issues, but try to work with your horse. He must be responsive. There I asked the horse to go directly into canter. She didn't question it and she went straight away. You'll see from my position that I'm living with the horse, very soft in my position and allowing the, the cog to develop the canter to just be held underneath me. I'm not having to work at the canter. Because of the way that we've trained our horses, they hold this canter and we, until we tell them to stop. Again, you'll notice from my position that it's nice and soft. With the top half, my hand is always in contact. My hand is living with the horse and my body movement is again in motion with the horse. There's a lot of complicated talk with riding, but actually, when you look at it from the naked eye, the rider and the horse should be living together as one. It's a very simple thing. Any harsh movements from the body, where the body starts to rock against the movement and look against the way that the horse goes, you'll see there, from the horse's reaction, that she was totally unsettled by that. Try to keep in motion with your horse, not trying to force your horse into any shape, but trying to work as horse and rider one unit. The contact should be always maintained with the contact position in the hand we discussed, where your arm, because of this movement here, can live with and be elastic in the contact. Your horse should be with the rider as one unit. But again, they should be very responsive. So if you wanted to stop, well, it can be very quick and very instantaneous. Just like I did the emergency stop just there. A little movement back with the body, a little closure in the hand. Horse and rider working as one, but not with domination but with cooperation. Good girl. We're going to go on and do some jumping now. 
And again, I'll reiterate the basic techniques over a rail. We're going to start doing some jumping now. And again, referring back to video one, I discussed the basic technique the horse needs to jump a fence. I also discussed the merits of the poles on the floor, the planks on the floor. And just again to reiterate, planks or square poles that can't roll away from the horse are always safer. We discussed that that produces the nice round stride, which is the key to our work. We also talked about the cross pole, encouraging the horse to go to the centre. I'm going to be coming round in canter. What I'm looking to try and produce is the round stride and again the horse using the technique to come back off the fence, weight distribution back on his hocks to be able to push himself upwards and then lastly forwards. My body position should be soft but releasing the seat rather than tipping the top half of the body and again keeping my head up at all times. My contact again going forward with the horse as she requires it and not being restrictive or using the hands to aid my position, structure or security. I'm going to do this a couple of times and then what I'd like to then try and show you is a more advanced grid. I call it the ultimate grid. And the reason why I say that is because it's got all the ingredients to help your horse produce the correct technique but also the right thought process. It's obviously a stage development and as we get to every different stage, I'll go through exactly the ingredient that we're now adding to this exercise. Without any further ado, I get on my horse and I'm going to be coming around in canter and one thing you'll notice is that it's very important that I keep changing the reins, alternating the way the horse goes. So many riders approach the fence from the same way, even though they don't know it, and that's going to produce a one-sided horse. Keep changing and alternating your reins and what you'll do is you'll give yourself a more balanced horse on both sides. <laughs> Turn left. Looking at my fence nice and early, allowing the turn to develop, let the fence come to me, body soft, go with the horse, looking up, turn right. Good girl. We're now going to add a second part. And what we're going to do is we're going to add a bounce. Now, first and foremost, the bounce, the idea of a bounce. Well, what actually happens when a horse does a bounce is that as he lands, he has to take off automatically from the front end, not the back end, which is where he normally gets his power from. The bounce in itself is a takeoff and a landing added together. That's half a stride for takeoff, half a stride for landing. And we know from the first video I mentioned, a horse's stride is 12 feet. That's 3.65 meters long. The average horse's stride is 3.65 meters long. And for this instance, we're going to make it a little bit shorter, purely because I want the horse to break from his front end. We're going to make this three and a half steps, approximately 3.2 meters. Just to show you, measure one, two, three and a half steps, which is 3.2 meters long. Again, going back to the bounce, the idea of the bounce is it gets the horse to use the shoulder and the front end. As it lands, it's then got to take off straight away. So what it'll do is it'll use the front end as a lever, pushing itself off the floor, but it will have to break the shoulder and the neck to give it momentum to go forwards. So as she lands, she'll then loose the front, front end, use the shoulder in that fashion to create the jump over the bounce. And what we're doing is we're encouraging this bascule shape and we're encouraging the horse to use its shoulder. As a rider, it's absolutely imperative that your balance, 
must be with the horse, but not against it. To help you in this, the legs should act as shock absorbers. Basically, the movement of the bounce is so intricate, so difficult, that you can't possibly try to sit to it. You would get bounced all over the place. So what you should do is, as you take off for the first, into jumping position, and then just allow the knees to act as a shock absorber, keeping your head forward and up as it goes through the bound. So it's there, like this, all the way through. So your balance is basically keeping with the horse to allow him or her to do their work. Keeping the head up is the key area as well, because that will help maintain the balance through your top half of your position. Also, it's quite important to know where you're going. Again, okay, looking at my fence nice and early. Now with the bounce, it's vitally important that I maintain my balance throughout. Don't come too fast in. Soft, soak with the body, looking up, go left. Good girly. The bounce is a very difficult thing for the horse to do, but it's even more difficult if your body movement is not in balance with your horse. Over, soak with the legs, look up, turn right. Keeping a rhythm through my corner, allowing the fence to come to me, round stride, off the seat, looking up, sit up gently, turn left. Super. Now we put our third piece into this grid. And it's quite an intricate part because with the first two bits, it's a bounce. It's getting the horse to use the shoulder, creating the bascule, that round technique, and creating that forward momentum via the bounce. Now we're going to put a spread, a parallel, an oxer at the end. And the idea here, here is that we're actually going to try and produce some power within our jump. We've got the shape, now we want to induce some power. The oxer itself is nothing to be worried about because with an average stride of 12 feet long, even an oxer like this is the equivalent of just a, a step or a curb to a human. But what we're going to do with this grid is we're actually going to raise it, but we're also going to widen it. And that will indeed create its own little problems. With the one stride that we've got in here, we've produced a white pole to create the nice round stride in the centre. Going back to what I said earlier, the round stride is the key. So the horse is now on the front end, if you like, from the bounce. But then it's got to balance itself, make a nice round productive stride over the white pole here in the centre. It's then got to prop, remember video one? Moving the body weight back onto the hocks to produce a jump that goes upwards. So that it can actually jump the ox or the parallel at the end. Once we've got the horse going down this two or three times, what we're then going to do is we're going to raise the bar, raise the height, but we're also going to add a little another problem in there. We're going to make it wider, but we're going to make it wider in a rather different way. We're going to shorten the distance. And the reason why we're going to do that is because not only are we making it taller to jump, but we're also making the distance so much shorter, so as to encourage the horse to come even more back on its hocks. Remembering what the first part of the grid was to do was to get the horse to use its shape and its shoulder. The second part of this grid is now trying to get the horse to prop, come back onto its hocks, make the balance shift backwards and to go up. But it can't just go up because it's got to go across as well because the, the width of it. By being shorter, it can't use power and pace just going forward. Otherwise, it'll make a mistake at the front rail. All these ingredients together to create a nice round stride going in, centered by the cross pole. The bounce to break the front end, in other words, to make the front end nice and soft and to make the horse use its shoulder. Again, the nice round stride here, but the shorter distance, but the wider fence means the horse has to come back more off the front rail, but push itself 
even higher and harder because it's also wider. And therefore, we're getting our horse to do everything we require within the jump. The shape, the stride, and the prop, and the power. And that's the reason why, for me, this is the ultimate grid. I think I'll get on now, and we'll see what happens. So now we've got all three parts of our grid put together. The horse is going to have a little bit of a look down this. Off, 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 go. Good girl. Keeping off the seat all the way down so as to allow the horse's back to use herself. And go. Good girl, turn right. Keeping our head up all the way in. Allowing the horse to jump and look up and go. And don't sit up too early. Even though it's a bit bigger, I don't ride it any different. It's up to the horse to see it's bigger and the horse to jump accordingly. Keeping straight, sit up gently. Good. Now, not only has it gone up, but it's actually gone a lot shorter now. So it's again ever so important that I don't come in too fast. The horse could then prop, come off herself and be able to jump the fence correctly. Very good, very good. So now it's shorter, but also bigger and wider. So I mustn't come in too fast. And it's vitally important that the horse is able to use herself and jump the fence, and I'm being able to not hinder her. I mustn't sit up with my body over the ox because that will stop her movement going forward. Soft with the body and then sit up. That's what I mean by the ultimate grid. And you can see that it tests the horse in all department. But what it also does, it gets the horse to have to think for himself. And he has to use his technique because we actually put the grid in such a way that the horse cannot use power to go forwards it has to use power to go upwards. And that's where the technique then scores dividends for us. These are the tips that create better and more successful show jumping for you and your horse. Good girl, good girl. Now we come to related distances. Now related distances cause a lot of problems for, for a lot of riders. But actually there's no reason why that should happen. Indeed what a related distance is, is where the course builder places two fences that have a relationship between each other. In other words, a set number of strides. That can be anything from three strides right up to seven strides. At more advanced levels, the course builder actually makes half distances. So instead of it being five nice strides, it might be five and a half strides. But more about that later. I think the first thing we've got to work out is how do you walk a related distance? And obviously the most important thing of all this is that you're able to walk a correct yardage or a correct stride pattern to measure from. There's no doubt that when people talk about uh, five strides or six strides of a human being equal to one horse stride, is no good whatsoever if that person walks like this, for instance, okay? Or indeed, makes a very big stride, because then their distance will be incorrect. So what we have to work out is exactly how long the horse's stride is. It is 12 feet long, 3.65 meters. For a guide, a jumping pole here is actually 12 feet long. Now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to use a measuring tape, measure it along here, and get to 12 feet. And what I'm going to do now is just practice walking the one horse stride. This is the length of the average horse stride at Canter. 
And what I'm going to do is to start with, just look down, just to check the distance. So all the time, you're starting to use these guides to help you. So one, two, three, four. Now you'll notice there that I started to get into a little bit of a rhythm. One, two, three, four. Once you've done that a couple or three times, practice then looking up so you're not looking down at the guide. One, two, three, four. Then looking down and you'll see that I've walked correctly four yards, 12 feet. If, while you're doing this, while you're looking up, one, two, three, four, and you look down, you can see that you're not doing the stride correctly. Vice versa, if you're doing it one, two, three, four, you can see that you're over-exaggerating the length of your stride. With a little bit of practice and a little concentration, you'll find that walking four yards, 3.6 meters, one horse stride becomes very natural. Two, three. And it's almost like something that you will not forget once you practice it. There we go, 12 feet. Once we've learned how to walk our yardage, as it were, then we have to gauge in proximity to the fences where our horse will land and take off. And here's, a, again, a very good clue. A lot of riders are very uh, unsure of what is the perfect takeoff point. Well, actually, it is very simple. It is half a stride away, two yards. Half a stride away is the landing, two yards, or indeed, two of our now steps that we're taking. So what we know by that is that the jump and the stride are totally linked. And if you remember, in all the things that I've done so far, I keep mentioning about the nice round stride. It's the key. This shows why. Because what we know is that the jump is nothing more than an exaggerated stride. The dimensions are stride dimensions. Once we know this, then we can start to concentrate and we can link in our flat work with our jumping. Because all the time we're trying to get a correct stride pattern. But we can't do that until we can walk a related distance. So what I'm going to do is do it now and show you exactly the way we walk a related distance. From the centre of the jump back to this fence, heel to the base of the fence, looking directly at the fence in front of you, walk two nice yards. This is where the horse should land. You then walk four nice strides, like we just showed you there with the tape measure and indeed the pole. One, two, three, four. This is one stride. This is the first stride. One, two, three, four. This is the second stride. One, two, three, four. This is the third stride. Now, vitally important when you're doing this, don't look down at your feet. If you do that, what you tend to do is take stilted type of strides. You might indeed think to yourself, oops, I took a short one, now I'll take a long one to try and compensate. Don't do that. Look up. Feel the stride. So now we're on three strides. One, two, three. This is the fourth stride. Where I'm stood now is the fourth stride. Okay, we've got one more stride left to do. One, two, three, four. This is now the takeoff point. We should be allowing two yards now for the takeoff. One, two. So now we know that there are five nice level strides between fence A and fence B of this related distance. All we need to do is to keep rhythm. And as long as the horse is taking the correct stride pattern, then the whole thing will just work just like clockwork. And again, by being aware of what the horse is doing underneath you and being aware of to what stride pattern he's taking, it means that you can ride him better and you can ride him a lot more softer. Because, indeed, if you jump that fence nicely and he stays in a nice rhythm, you're always going to meet this fence in the correct place, as long as he's taking the correct stride pattern. One other little thing to remember is that when the course builder at the shows is building for uh, the class or the competition, 
he's not building for your horse in particular. He's actually building for the average horse. So by doing this, it is really important that your horse is able to take the correct stride pattern. He's not going to change things because your horse takes a big stride or your horse takes a small stride. He's only going to build the course for the average horse. So just like the, the men that go and join the army and that are taught to march, they start to learn to take the correct stride pattern while they're marching. And by doing that, if we train our horses the same, we are training a horse to fit the courses that the course builders design. If you ride a horse making always the stride compact and short, actually what you're doing is creating a horse that will not fit the courses and therefore he will struggle when the height limit goes up. So really remember, work on the relatedness of the stride pattern and maintain the correct stride pattern. And that's the way to do it. Four yards equals one horse stride and we allow half a stride for landing, half a stride for takeoff. We're going to ride it now and I'm going to show you the regulatory stride, the horse going down and making five nice strides, we're also going to identify the strides with some poles. Again, to give you a better idea of the regular stride pattern attached to this sort of work. We're now going to be riding this related distance. What I'm going to do is get into a nice productive stride pattern. Keeping fluent around the corner, looking at my fence nice and early, keeping my rhythm, there it is, straight on, sit up, one, two, three, four, five strides, ride straight, and land, good. You'll notice that as I'm going down the related distance, I'm actually counting out loud the strides. Not only is it for your benefit, but it's also for mine. It's really important that the, your brain is in tune with what the horse's stride is doing. Also, you'll be able to feel the horse's stride by actually counting out loud the stride pattern, what you're starting to do is to associate the stride. I call it stride relation. In other words, you're actually producing the link between the horse's legs and your brain. Because while you're riding the horse, actually your legs are the horse's legs. You are one unit. So it is really important that you're in tune with what's happening underneath you. Don't forget, it's not a machine. And therefore, you have to react to what the horse is doing. Only by being totally in tune with what the horse is doing can you make the right decisions. Practice that. Go down your related distances, shouting them or counting them out loud and see how much in tune your brain is with your horse's legs. And then that might give you a clue as to why maybe you're having a few problems. What we're doing now is we put some poles on the floor to show you each individual stride. Pay particular attention to the deliberate way that she makes each round stride and how level they all are. One, two, three, four and five. Nice and balanced all the time regulatory in her stride. There, she's using herself, but she's not rushing. And by doing so, she's able to maintain her balance all the way down. And as long as she's taking the correct stride pattern, every distance is going to work for her. It's the best way to train horses to stay regular. Good girl. Now we've got our horse more regular, taking the correct stride pattern. I'm now going to show you the exercise that we use to give our horse gears. In other words, to be able to lengthen and shorten. It's imperative that our horse is able to go forward as well as backwards. So by having gears, it's just like driving a car. If you had a car that only had top gears, it'd be fine on the motorway, but it wouldn't be very good for round town. If you had a car that had first and second gears for instance, it'd be fine around town, but it wouldn't be very good for driving up the motorway. 
And what we've got to have is a horse that's all round. We're going to use the five stride distance that we've just been riding. But what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to come down and ride it on six. Now that actually means that I've got to make six strides, two feet shorter, every single one, two feet shorter, so as to create six level strides. And then I'm going to go seven. And then I'm going to go back and do it on five strides. So just to show you the lengthening and the shortening on the horse responding to that. Now to give you a little tip, when you're actually going to shorten your horse up, by your flat work training, where you use your body in a downward transition, and a little bit of contact through the front of the bridle, where you actually close your horse down. The way to do it is to give a little bit more reining backwards, not in a harsh way so the horse inverts off you. But by doing that, the horse will automatically start to condense his canter. The important trick is not to allow the horse to break into trot. By condensing his canter, obviously the stride shortens. One little tip, don't put too much leg on because in actual fact you're sending your horse two different messages. The leg is saying go forward and the hand is saying stop. In fact, it's like a green light with the leg and a red light with the hand. That's confusing for the horse. Actually, close down with the hand, a little bit of movement gently backwards with the body, keeping your leg gently there, don't use any more leg. The horse should naturally start to close down in his canter. If he does it too much and breaks into trot, obviously use a little bit of leg to move him back up into the canter. But don't put the leg on to stop him, because like I said, that's a confusing sign. I'm going to show you how we do it. And again, don't forget, practice makes perfect. By knowing that it's five strides and by counting down the six, you will start to feel the shortening in relation to your brain. The first thing that we do when we're coming to the cant, to the first bit of our work, is we actually close down the canter, come in a more softer canter. Pop the fence, one, two, three, four, five, and six nice level strides, go straight. We're now going to go seven strides. Now that means to say, we've got to go even shorter in the canter. But again, that's just a little contact through the front end. Just waiting for the fence. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. We now go back. We're now going to go back to the five. And again, the reason why we're doing this is to show the correct stride pattern. So again, filling our canter back up. One, two, three, four, and five. Good girl. So that's the lengthening and shortening. Remember, two very important factors. When you're going to shorten your horse, contact, closing the contact in the front end, being quite positive, body up. Don't use too much leg because that is a confusing issue. Your horse must not attack the fence and neither must you because if you do that, it all becomes very rough and also you're contradicting yourself. When you attack the fence and then you go to shorten, all you end up doing is telling your horse confusing messages. If you notice there, the horse, when I closed down the rhythm and got the required rhythm for the six or the seven strides, the horse was very soft to the fence. Horses should not attack the fence. Riders override fences, generally as a rule, purely because they're a little bit nervous and they want to get the job over and done with. But it's really important that as a rider you're more softer. Don't forget your job is only to get the takeoff point. This job, this horse's job, is to jump the fence. When you're doing your courses and when you're doing your rounds, always be thinking of your rhythm and your stride pattern, and as a result of which, you'll be putting your energies into what is important, and not so much the jump, because after all, that's this thing's job, jump the jump.
Now we come to jumping a course, where we put all the training techniques that we did earlier into practice. And if you remember back to video one, where I mentioned the little rhyme, canter, rhythm and line, gets it right every time. Same thing here. We're trying to look at keeping balance, rhythm on direct lines throughout the course. So without any further ado, I think we'll walk the course. It's a little bit more technical and therefore certain control issues will come into operation. And that's exactly what we were talking about earlier. The first fence. It's actually going to be this black and white oxer here. But one little thing that I noticed straight away, it as you're coming round to the first fence, behind the blue and yellow vertical, actually the first fence that it'll see is this fence, the black and white vertical, and not the black and white oxer, in other words, the parallel. So it might get a little bit drawn to the wrong fence. It's very important that when you're coming to the first fence, you quickly tell the horse which fence you're coming to so that he doesn't get confused as to say, is it this one or that one? So to make sure as you're coming around the corner, the horse focusing on the correct fence straight away. Don't forget, he didn't walk the course, you did. So he's not sure. Make sure that he knows straight away which fence he's coming to. It's a fairly straightforward fence. Not too many problems. Again, the only thing that might occur is the horse might be distracted by the double that is behind the fence. As long as you keep a nice central line, that shouldn't come into play. Try to walk the line that you're going to ride. What will happen is that you'll maybe pick up certain things which you wouldn't appreciate if you just cut from one fence to another. We're going to be turning right, coming around the turn here, and our next fence is the black and white vertical. Now, as we're coming round here, the fence after the black and white is going to be our green and pink fence. And you'll see that it's slightly set on a dogleg diagonal. In other words, it's slightly off-centre. That means to say that if we come around on the right rein, we've got to watch that the horse doesn't jump to the left-hand side. Because if it does that, it's actually going to make the distance all wrong. We want to try and keep a nice central position to this fence and we're going to walk the distance centre to centre from the black and white to the green and pink and work out the distance like we did earlier with our two and four stride uh, situation or two and four strides being the takeoffs, landings and the stride itself. So one, two, this is where the horse shall land. One, two, three, four, this is one stride. One, two, three, four, this is two strides. One, two, three, four, this is three strides. One, two, three, four, this is four strides. One, two, and I've got indeed a little bit left over. What I know from that is that the distance from centre to centre on a nice smooth curl is a little bit what we call forward. Not long, more forward. By using the words forward or closed or backwards is a lot better than using things like long or short because that really is quite a harsh way of describing something. By thinking of the word forward, actually what you'll do is you'll land and you'll just gently ease the stride forward. Going back to what we did earlier, showing the control, the gears, this is exactly the situation that we were discussing, where you might just have to open the stride up a little bit. The oxer itself isn't too difficult, except it's jumping into the corner. And that in itself will stifle the horse's approach. So you've got to be very aware that he's got to take a central line and he doesn't jump across the fence as indeed a lot of horses might do when they know they're going to be turning left. They'll start the turn a little bit early. So keep him nice and central so that when he lands, he uses the full corner. We really want to be using the arena up to this area. We don't want to be cutting this off because that is in itself going to create problems. The more sharper the turn, the more likely the horse's stride is going to shorten to accommodate such a severe turn. If you get your horses to get into the habit 
of using the full arena, you'll maintain your rhythm so much easier. And as a result of which, you'll also maintain your balance. I've made quite a tricky line now, going round the turn. We're going to go from this yellow vertical, we're then going to go across the school in an almost uh, right angle to the left hand side, to the planks in the centre. And that's quite a sharp and severe turn. What we've got to watch here is that we don't come too forward to this fence. If we do that, we'll almost be past the turn before we need to actually turn left-handed. So what I should do after the longer distance that we just had is close the canter down so as to get a softer jump because obviously we've got a sharper turn to make after this fence. By doing this again, you're being more disciplined into your ride. So what I would do is I would come around the corner, close down the rhythm so as to get a soft jump over this vertical so as to allow me the time and also the control to make the sharp turn to the planks. I'm actually not going to walk the distance here, purely and simply because it's such a sharp turn, it would be very difficult to replicate the line that I'm going to walk when I'm riding a horse. All I've got to remember is to maintain my balance through these turns. What is vitally important is that I must not jump this one on the angle because the next fence after this is that red and white. So we've actually got a complete S shape through the whole of this course. If I made too straight a turn here, then I'm going to be jumping that on such a severe angle, it might mean that the horses run out. What I've got to try and do is put two very nice and smooth turns. And again, using the word smooth, by keeping the turn smooth, I can maintain my stride pattern. And as we know, the jump comes from the stride. The more the stride suffers, the more chance that the jump suffers. What is also important along here is that as a rider, you are thinking very much of the next fence, almost like a little chain reaction, not just trying to jump one fence, then the other, then the other. Actually think of it as a whole. So you're thinking how to jump that first fence, smooth and soft around the turn. A nice little quiet jump, again, over the middle one to make the right hand bend so we can jump the red and white vertical at the end of this. This is a very technical type of distance we're going to be riding here. But again, what it's doing is, it's testing a rider and horse's ability to actually be as one and not to rush. This will cause a lot of problems for a horse that was too eager to jump the fence. The fences would come almost uh, like bullets at it. It would become so quick. What we've got to do here is have control and balance in two changes of direction in such a short proximity to each other. The next fence is going to be this white double that you see here. Now again, a course builder would use this type of situation to really create problems. And what he's done here, look, he's made such a sharp turn that actually your stride is always going to suffer because of the severity of your turn. Bearing in mind your horse's stride is 12 feet long at average at canter, there's no way you're going to be able to maintain a 12 foot canter around such a severe and sharp turn. So what we've got to do is try and keep coming through the corner with as much balance as possible. To do that, we shall start our turn a little bit earlier than probably you think. We should start it around about here, where the sign is. So as to try to keep our stride pattern as even as possible. If we were to go deeper into the turn, all we would do is make our turn here so much sharper. And by doing that, we'd lose not only the rhythm, but we'd probably lose our balance as well. Keep the turn smooth, keep the turn to accommodate your stride pattern, the chances are you maintain your balance, and also you maintain some sort of rhythm. 
This will be a very, very, very good fence for a course builder to cause problems at. Also, you'll notice that it is totally white, even including the wing stands. And again, white is one of the most difficult fences for a horse to pick up because of his views of things. That would almost mishmash together. It would be easier if it was one single fence. But to have a double means that a horse can't really focus as well as, as he should do because of the lack of contrast in the pole description. If it was black and white or red and white or indeed yellow, it would be a lot easier for the horse to pick up. As a rider, you must not lose your cool here, even if the horse spooks a little bit. By keeping your contact elastic, you've nearly got him between hand and leg. In other words, you're able to reassure him with your ride. If you had to come off the corner, he was to spook a little bit, in other words, to back off it a little bit, and you were to panic, you're more likely to get the horse to stop or indeed make a big mistake. By keeping him with a nice elastic contact, closing your leg around him to reassure him, the chances are that he's going to look at it, have a little spook, but with a bit of luck, jump it, and then away you go to the next fence. Again, keeping cool, don't panic in those situations. The horse is looking to you for a surety. As a rider, it is vitally important that you are thinking to it all the time positive and not panicking. We're going to walk the distance in the double. One, two. This is where the horse will land. One, two, three, four. And only one for takeoff. So what we know is that this distance is very short. It's actually, instead of one full non-jumping stride, he's actually built it for three quarters of a non-jumping stride. This again requires a little discipline from us as a rider. We must not come in that fence or to this double too forward, too fast, too long. Because if we do so, the horse is going to land going forwards into a short distance, it's going to end in disaster. We've got to come round the corner, get a soft jumping, going back to what we talked about earlier, having the right gears, lengthening and shortening. This is a short distance. We do not want to be coming into it too forwards. We want to be coming into it in a waiting, pack, waiting way, a very soft way, so as to allow the horse just to pop in, take the shorter stride, and then pop out. It's a spooky sort of fence, and what you'd like to do is come in riding it with force, but the distance won't allow. And that's the sort of thing that today's show jumpers have got to cope with. Discipline from a rider is what you've got to have. The last fence on our course today is the red and white oxer. Again, you'll see it's slightly offset against the double here. We're coming out of this double in a short fashion. We're now going to walk the distance, again in a natural line, a line that we're going to be able to ride. Not straight and acute, but with a little bit of a curl in there. And see what the distance is. One, two, this is where the horse should land. One, two, three, one stride. One, two, three, four, two strides. One, two, three, four, three strides. One, two, three, four, four strides, one, two, three, four, five strides. This is the fifth stride. This is the fourth stride. You'll notice there's nowhere for takeoff. What we've actually got here is a half stride distance. It exactly walks four and a half strides. And here's the issue. Do we go forward on the four, or we do, do we go backwards on the five? What you've got to do in this situation is take all the things into the equation. We're just coming out of a short distance, i.e. the double of verticals. And because of that, the horse won't be going forwards. If it had been long, he would be coming forwards out. But it's short, so he'll be actually coming out very soft. It's got a little dog leg in there. So in other words, it's not even in a direct line. 
For me, the only option here is to be coming backwards because that's really the line. That's really the way that it is. It's a soft distance there, soft distance here. If we'd have come um, soft and tried to go long here, we could get flat and easily have the last fence. Again, the course builder is trying to test your resolve. Will you keep cool to the last or will you try and blow it all? And how many riders have the last fence all the time? Because they don't keep the cool, they're too uh, anxious to get home and jump the clear round. You haven't jumped the clear round until you've jumped the last fence. Here I'm going to jump the double and then wait and make the five strides. Even though it's a oxa, a spread fence, I'm not going to get suckered into going on the forward one. I'm going to make a nice soft and waiting five strides there so as to give the horse every chance to jump this fence. By working the course correctly and by being able to see the problems beforehand, it allows you to devise a plan. I'm not saying it always goes according to the plan. There are horses after all and things can always go wrong. But as a rider, if you can devise a plan and try and ride to it, it means that you've got a target to aim for. And as a result of which, you can be decisive. What I mentioned in video one was that horses, they, they can't walk the course, but they know if you're indecisive. They know if you're nervous. They know if you are uh, frightened of something. They can feel that. By devising a plan, by getting into the habit of walking a course, being able to walk the distance correctly, and having the control to be either going forward or indeed coming back, means that you can be so much more accurate, but also decisive in your ride. And that's where a horse is going to improve on you. If you just went round and tried to just jump the jumps willy-nilly, the chances are you're going to make lots of mistakes. And that's when the horse stops listening to you. By having a plan gives you a very clear and precise way of trying to ride the course. As a result of which, you'll probably ride your horse with a lot more definition and indeed more positiveness. And that's really what it's all about. I think we'd better go and try and ride it now, try and show you. Now we're going to jump the course. Trying to put into effect all the plans that we made when we walked our course. And again, trying to be aware of the next fence and our rhythm and our canter stride. Always be thinking about the three things. Canter, rhythm, line. Gets it right every time. Let's give it a go, see how we get on. Nice smooth turn. Let him see where he's going. Use the full turn. Look at my next fence, nice and early. This is a little forward, this distance. So bring the rhythm up to meet the black and white. One, two, three. Use the full turn, get control, change of legs, sit up. Now I want to be soft to this. As soon as I get there, look at the next fence. Now. Look at my next fence. Look at my next fence, but again, keeping the turn nice and smooth around the turn, keeping the rhythm. I'm waiting for the five now. One, two, three, four. Super. Very nice. Coming to the first fence. Nice smooth rhythm. Let the horse know where he's going. That's a nice distance, let him jump it. Get control before you land and before you turn. Smooth around the turn. This next distance is quite forward, so bring the rhythm up to meet it. Look at the next one. One, two, three, super. Get in control, now close down. We just want to pop this fence because we've got a very severe turn afterwards. Look at the next one. Look at the next one. Super. Get in control, keeping your rhythm 
not too tight around the turn so as to lose your stride pattern. Pop in, pop. One, two, three, four, five. Very nice. Very nice. Now we come to the troubleshooting section. I'm trying to show one or two problems that are very common among lots of riders, specifically aimed at related distances. One of the most common ones is riders say they have no problems in going on longer distances, but struggle when it comes to riding a shorter distance. The main reason for this is because they accelerate onto their fence. They don't realize they do it in normal circumstances, but when the distance is short, by having too forward a jump in, it actually makes the distance shorter. We're going to show you a horse now and rider where the distance is a little bit short. It's a soft four strides and the rider is going to override going in. And you'll see how much work he has to do to try and bring the horse back to make the four strides. Basically, you'll see there, he's two forward in, one stride, two strides, three, oh! He has to work very hard to try and make the distance. He's wrestling with the horse. The horse lost its shape directly on the last stride. In fact, on the approach to the fence on the last stride, the rider was still fighting with the horse and the horse was inverted on the bridle. Here, the horse has to wait for the fence but actually the rider has got to instigate that. It's very similar to, to, to anything in life where you have to make a decision. If you're on a diet and there's a difference between a sticky bun or indeed a bowl of grapes, the bowl of grapes is better for you. It's the same thing if you're coming into a short distance and you see the long stride or the long distance going to it, say, no, that's not for me and wait for one more. Always remember that if you see a long distance to a fence, the chances are there's a nice short one directly behind it. It's just a question of keeping nice and cool. You have to be disciplined. You have to tell your horse what you're trying to do. It's not that he won't listen to you, it's just that you're probably telling him the wrong things. Okay. As you see now, he's coming in, he's waiting for the fence. One, two, three, four. It's a lot more even the stride pattern, purely because he had a better approach at the first element of the related distance. Another problem is where the distance is a little bit more technical, where it's a half stride. The problem is that the rider wants to go on the five strides. The horse lands, takes a little bit of a run, the rider goes to make five strides, halfway through, changes its mind, kicks it on the four strides. The problem is there, that the rider one minute was telling the horse, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, and then the next minute changes the mind completely and gives it a big kick to send it forwards. What that shows is that rider isn't A, disciplined, B, convinced of their own actions, and C, the horse doesn't listen to the rider. If you're apt to change your mind in that situation, the chances are your horse will not listen to you in the future. You have to stick to your guns. When you're training your horse, you have to have a very clear idea of what you're trying to produce and a distinct and definite way of producing it. So now Mikey's told me that he's actually going to go for the five. One, two, three, Oh, changed his mind right at the last moment there. Big kick. Thought that he couldn't get the extra stride in, so he gave it a big kick. One minute he said, wait, and then the next minute he said, oh, forget that, and kicked it on the long one. Stick to your guns. The worst scenario is that you can make a mistake and the horse knock the jump down. It might even indeed stop, but by you sticking to your guns, you're being consistent. When you change your mind halfway through a distance, what you're actually saying to your horse is, I don't really know what I'm doing here, so I'm going to panic. 
As a result, your horse will stop listening to you more because you are apt to change your mind and the indecisiveness will actually wreck the confidence both of you as a rider and your horse. It's very destructive to change your mind. Try and stick to your guns. Try and follow through your instructions. At least then the horse knows what to expect. So this time, he's going to ride with a lot more surety, a lot more distinction. Wait, one, two, three, four, five. As you saw there, the horse took a little bit of a run on the last stride, said, come on, Dad, this is where we go. But that time, Michael said, no, we're waiting. And as a result, the horse listened to him, made the five strides, and all of a sudden, Michael's reputation, if you like, within that partnership between horse and rider is now intact because he made a decision and stuck to it and the result was very pleasing and very nice. What I've got built behind me is a combination, a three-part combination and what I've done here is I've made the first part A to B a normal one non-jumping stride but what has happened is in the second part I've made it short I'll walk the distance to show you how short it is. One, two, this is where the horse will land. One, two, three, four, one stride, one, two. That's a normal one non-jumping stride. In the second part, one, two, this is where the horse will land. One, two, three, one stride, one, two, three, two strides, and I've only got one left over. So in actual fact, it's one and three quarters. The distance coming out is one and three quarters. So it's a little short. The ox are in the center, the parallel in the center is gonna throw you out. This is the sort of combination which will be seen in young rider classes, in classes at maybe a championship level like Horse of the Year show or indeed any final at national level. The idea behind this is that it's a very simple problem, but so often wrongly executed. What happens is when a rider comes out and says, oh, it's short coming out the combination, the riders come in waiting in a soft way. The problem is that when they do that, by coming in in a waiting fashion, you actually land a little bit short and not going forward, so indeed you're further off the middle part. Therefore, you have to give the horse a bit of a kick to throw it over there. In other words, you press the forward button. When you do that, you're actually again going forward into a short distance, as a result of which that distance, which is already short, becomes even shorter still. The way to ride a combination when it's short coming out is to actually come in quite full, quite strong, not galloping. By doing so, the horse then takes a proper full stride and he has to wait and prop. By doing so, you can then be waiting coming out. If you come in too backwards, all you do is make this too long and then that even shorter. So the trick is to come in on a good full stride, productive stride, start waiting in the middle element. That's lovely. So he's got in there, now he can wait. Very nice. By being as clear as that, then what happens is as he gets in there, the middle element is the one where the horse backs up, he's having to wait then Therefore, the distance coming out, which is short, doesn't become increasingly short. Again, it's by clarity and by definition, by being able to walk the distance correctly and being able to interpret exactly what's going to happen, leads you to a clearer decision making. And therefore, you're more liable to make the right decision rather than the wrong ones. Those are just three little 
areas that cause confusion. So I hope they've cleared them up for you. And I wish you better and more successful show jumping. Thank you. What we've tried to show you today is basically a few of the tips, again, on how to get better results from your show jumping. Control is one of those things that it needs to be worked out between horse and rider. But by having a clear definition as to the regular stride pattern, the correct stride pattern, and then how much to shorten the stride, having that feel for the stride and being able to uh, work your horse on lengthening and shortening all add to more successful show jumping. What I've tried to show you is, is by being more positive, being able to plan a course and being able to execute a course, you're going to ride your horse with a lot more definition and clarity. And after all, the horse is going to improve beyond all measure if he knows what you're trying to ask him to do. Keeping th certain rules and applying certain techniques, the canter, the rhythm and the line, these are certain things you need to adhere to to help you with your show jumping. Practicing your control and having a very clear picture of what you're aiming towards as well is going to help you. I hope you've learned something and I look forward to seeing you on the next edition of Successful Show Jumping with Tim Stockdale. In the next edition of Successful Show Jumping, we're going to be doing more intricate grid work. We're going to be looking at certain sort of fences and the problems that you might encounter with them and trying to execute them. Then we're going to be doing a really technical course and quite big as well. So I look forward to seeing you on the next edition of Successful Show Jumping with Tim Stockdale.